sound okay? Wow, what a, what a day today. A lot of excitement and all the entrepreneurs, all the big companies, uh, just the energy. I've been truly, truly blown away. All the activity on social media leading up to this. I got to meet Keith today. I'm sure Keith's here. This is the first time I've ever spoken in a swimming pool. I, uh, I've done it all. I think I'm going to go home now. I, I want to talk about Silicon Valley, but I want to talk about it maybe in a different way than you, you thought about it. So I want to talk about disruption, but I'm not going to talk as much about startups. If you think of Silicon Valley and startups, you probably come to the wrong lecture. But I, I want to talk about Silicon Valley and what we think is a very new way. So, we have this one today? We do. Uh, I think everyone knows the hashtag for the event. Uh, there's my Twitter handle and, and my email address. So if you want these slides, by all means, uh, just shoot the email and we'll send them to you. You have the distinct advantage of the next hour of tweeting and I can't respond. So take advantage of it. Um, I, live, I live in the heart of Silicon Valley. I live in the same postcode as, as Google. So they're my neighbors and, and they've been my neighbors for a long time. But at the same time, I spend most of my time outside of Silicon Valley, all around the world, with big multinationals that are trying to understand Silicon Valley, is it going to disrupt them? How do I compete with Google? How do I compete with Facebook and Apple? And so the story I want to tell today is this, this tension between what, what these companies in Silicon Valley are doing and what multinationals around the world are doing to, to react to it. So I always like to say that if I'm up here talking, I should try to do three things. I should try to educate you and teach you things you didn't know. I should try to entertain you and keep it lively. And I should try to shock you. And so, so well, I'll try for the trifecta today. I'll try for all three. Um, when I ask people what do they think of when they hear the word Silicon Valley, they usually they think of two guys in a garage. It's always two guys in the garage, but, but they think of HP, they think of Apple, they think of, of Google. I wish there was more women in technology. I think there's a forum on that tomorrow. Friends of mine uh, are leading that. But they often think of this, uh, this long list of activity, right? They think of, if I say Silicon Valley, you think of Sand Hill Road and all the venture capital, you think of Stanford, you hear that it's okay to fail there. Maybe number 10, you think it's kind of isolated from the rest of the world, and it's kind of, uh, uh, it has a lot of, a lot of arrogance, self-centered, or maybe cheap. These are the, these are the, the, the classic associations people have with Silicon Valley. Maybe you think of all these logos as well, you know, for 75 years it's churned out a lot of technology. Done. We've done a lot of research in the last two years, and we think it's made a major shift. And the first thing I want you to do today is unlearn. I want you to forget forever that it's the high tech capital of the world. It, it, it doesn't do that anymore. The, what do you mean? Well, well, the high tech capital of the world was selling everyone a technology stack. This was Larry Ellison, right? Because Larry Ellison was an editor in all the airports in the world, Oracle, I run on 49 of the world's 50 largest banks. Right? That's, we've all seen those advertisements. It, it sells the same technology of everyone and it says, you know, good luck. And I, I describe that model, it's, it's effectively been an arms merchant. That's what it does, it sells. I know there's three operators uh, here today, but it's sold. Orange and Zane and, and uh, Ubi have the exact same technology stack. And, and, and half those companies got an advantage from it by arguing they really haven't. But 
But the new model, what we think, what we know Silicon Valley is now doing, is I describe it as the, the industry disruption capital of the world. Well, what do you mean by that? I mean that instead of selling the world a technology stack, it's building businesses to compete with who it used to just sell technology to. So Oracle used to sell Lumia and Zane and, and Orange technology. But now it, we, we, we call it sometimes the OGT print. It's happening across all these industries now. The Ubers and the Airbnbs are trying to build businesses to compete with what was the, the, the supplier relationship. And I describe that more as a, as a mercenary. And you think about mercenary operations, it's very, very different than a arms emergency. You know, a mercenary, it's a professional army. They're professional soldiers. And you give them the absolute best weapons. And you pay them well. And you say, go on the battlefield and take land. In other words, take market share. And, and this is what we think the new game is now. This is what we think how Silicon Valley has evolved. So okay, that's a pretty big, big statement. Mark, what do you mean? Look at all of these industries. Look at, look at the top, look at the, the mobile handset business. For 15 years, we had Motorola and Nokia and Rim. And then along comes Apple. Google are taking $75 billion a year away from Motorola, Nokia, and RIM. One of those companies is effectively gone, but the other two are very much struggling. We used to have Star Trek, and they were cool, right? But that was a very, very lousy experience. I don't think of Google as a search company, and I don't think of Facebook as a, as a social media company. If you follow the money, it's, it's advertising. That's now approaching $50 billion that they're taking off of, uh, off of traditional advertisers into the digital world. This is happening in music. It's happening in, in, in movies and hospitality. Many, many sectors we're seeing these new ecosystems forming. So it's not about startups anymore. It's not about high tech anymore. Uh, I, I should say that uh, strange running a big company somewhere in the world, a big, big company, a giant company, what you think about, I mean, this is a very small font, lots of words, but what you, what you worry about is somebody coming into your industry and redefining how it's going to work. They come in and what you think are your strengths become your weaknesses. They come in with a superior customer proposition. They come in with a cost structure that's unlike yours. And, and they tend to take away your profitable customers and kind of leave you with the unprofitable ones. They, they leave you with the, the lower end segment, which is, which is less large and less interesting. And this is what we're seeing happen in, in several industries now. Did anybody read this uh, this article? Mark Andreessen? Who knows who, who, who knows who Mark Andreessen is? Mark Andreessen? Mark Andreessen? Mark? Do you ever use a browser? Mark invented the browser, basically. And Mark founded Netscape, and then he later built a, an early cloud company, so that Hewlett Packard, who was so big, he sat on Hewlett Packard's board, he saw Hewlett Packard's board, he used his board. But he's a very well-known investor. He invested early in, 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 in Facebook and Twitter and, and uh, Lyft, Uber competitor. But, but a couple of years ago, he wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal, it's down at the bottom. And he said, software is leading the world. And what he meant is that software is getting inside of all industries. And he, as an investor, saw a lot of opportunity ahead. That he thought his startups at his firm and Dreesen Horowitz, that they were going to continue to do very well, that they were going to succeed in competing against big incumbent industries. He, he's a very clever investor. He's invested about four and a half billion dollars, but 
His view is these startups that are in Silicon Valley all around the world have a lot of advantages. They can move fast, the cost of doing disruption is getting lower and lower, right? The cost to do the, the software is getting cheaper, the, the cost to acquire customers is getting less. Um, your recipe to be successful in doing a startup is for your a clean startup. It's like a Make a pie, it's so easy. So, so it's, it's never been easier to take a shot at disrupting a big company. It's a lot harder 20 years ago. It's easy now. And Mark is saying, software is eating the world. I'm going to bet on my, on my startups. Very strange clicker. So, our research has been looking at these companies. And the question becomes, are they, are they doing things, are they exhibiting behaviors that large incumbents, large multinationals around the world can learn from? And we think they are. We think when you look at these companies, their organizations, the way they do management, the way they do leadership, the way they evolve their culture, the way they find the talent, the way they recruit talent, the way they treat people, is so fundamentally different in large organizations, and our view is that large organizations ought to be paying attention to how these companies manage themselves. Yes, they create great products, and yes, they, they, they you know, we, we all use many of the products every day, but the secret isn't in the product. We actually think the secret is in the company, in the, in the people. So what I'm going to share with you now is about 20 organizational lessons, call it a, a playbook, that we think they're practicing. And as I go through them, one at a time, you may say, oh, okay, I've heard of that one, it's kind of interesting. Oh, I've heard that one before. But I suggest you look at all of them together, look at all 20 of them together, because it is a playbook that they're practicing all of them, not just one of them. And I think that companies that get to practice more of them will just frankly be more successful. So let's start, ready? 20 of them. I have less than an hour. <coughs> the first one is growth. They, they are obsessed with growth. Obsessed. And it's the primary metric. It's, it, it's simple. This is the way, I don't care if you're a startup in this room or you run a Jordan's largest company. Financial markets work on a very simple idea. Put 1,000 JD in today, and in a future date, the investor wants more than 1,000 JD out. That's how financial markets work. If you're the smallest private company and then you want an investor, or you're you know, Jordanian Airlines, you're Lumia, then that is the way capital growth, growth matters, period. And if you're not growing, you know, as a public company, as a small company, you're just not interesting. Their, their primary driver, period. And let me, let me put a final point on this. If you go around the world, there's close to 5,000 companies, 4,800, that have at least one billion US dollars of revenue, billion dollars. And I just hand you a spreadsheet, and in that spreadsheet, I say to you, I say, write a quick formula, and pull out all the companies, show me what percentage of companies are growing by 5% a year for five years in a row. Not a big number. I just want 5% a year for five years in a row. Can you guess what that number is? Hard to hear in a swimming pool. The number is 8%. In other words, 92% of large companies around the world aren't growing by 5% a year. And I think that's terrible. I open the bank reports. We're innovative. And I go into their companies and we have innovation labs. But the facts, we publish in Harvard Business Review, Rita McGrath at NYU, 92% pulled the facts and data. I talked to Rita about how she did research. 92% of these large companies are not growing very fast. But the disconnect, the problem is they all tell me they're innovative. And it says that we're innovation on the first page, and they have innovation labs, and they have they hire too many consultants. Promised innovation. So there's a real disconnect here. 
I think, I think most of them are faking it. I think the word innovation has lost a lot of meaning. It's a nice word, but I don't think they're practicing innovation in, in a way that's providing growth to their firms, as the data suggests. Number two, I think we're on two. I, I, I watch these companies and they, when it comes to strategy, they, they don't follow, they don't do what everyone else is doing. They're really good at what I call cutting against the grain. Or if, or if you're going to zig, zig, I'm going to zag. If, you're, if, every, if the herd is going that way, it's time to go that way. They're very good at cutting across when, what everyone else is doing. And they do it in such a way that, that, that they do it right, they can extract billions of dollars of shareholder value. And we'll talk about it a little bit later. They don't necessarily have to be first. In fact, they're, they're good at following. Uh, before Facebook, there was MySpace. Before the iPhone and Android, there was Motorola, Nokia, and Rim. I mean, we had the GSM chips out of the market for 16 years, from 1991 until 2007, when the iPhone came out. So, you don't have to be first. Your timing has to be good, but you don't have to be first. But they're very good at, at, at figuring out what's wrong and cutting across where, where the mainstream is heading. There's a 
big conference every year, and they just had it last month in San Francisco. It's called Fail Month. Fail, seal, and fail conference. Fail month. Imagine going to a conference where people are standing up, public company executives, and talking about failure. Strategy isn't thinking about it. Strategy is actually getting it, getting it done and, and, and 
executing well. Uh, and, and these these disruptors, I think, are absolutely relentless at, at quality execution. Most of them didn't have original ideas. Most of them were doing, uh, you know, they were following others on, on their core idea, but they were relentless in execution.
decisions in big companies are, are black and white, and our decisions in disruptors are gray. And what I mean by that is, who, who in a big company has ever been in the room and somebody says, we should do A, and then somebody else in the line says, well, that's kind of a dumb idea because two years ago, we tried it and it didn't work, or, or two years ago, we decided not to do that. So big companies, traditional incumbents, multinationals, they kind of think in black and white. And they cross something off the list, and they, and, and they typically cross it off the list forever. But the context is always changing. The, the Moore's Law is changing. The economics is changing. The marketplace is changing. And what I see the disruptors doing really well is they don't stop a project, they don't kill it, but they kind of leave it simmering, and they leave it on the back burner, and they want to maybe come back to it. The, in finance, we call these options. An option is a, a right but not an obligation to do something, right? You have, a, you have an option to buy a house or something. But if you kill an option, by definition, it's dead. So what they're doing is they're really good at portfolio, and they're keeping several ideas, very low cost on the back burner, and the idea is if I have a really big portfolio of ideas, then I can leverage that down the road. Versus if I keep killing stuff off and saying we're going to do that and not that, and I just shut it down, and I, and, and, and I cross it off the list and I get it out of my memory, then you don't have any options to think about. So you don't necessarily need to think of the, the, the idea first. Wait till somebody else does it and then learn from their mistakes. It's okay to be a fast follower, you don't have to be first to market. Anybody, by a show of hands, by a show of hands, anybody in here on in finance? Okay? No, raise your hand on finance, finance. Kick them, <laughs> kick them off the innovation team. Don't let them anywhere near innovation. Uh, I remember I said I was going to shock people. Where, where is, uh, where is that on the, uh, on the, uh, CFO? Uh, He's probably right. Okay, it's away from innovation. Look, here's the problem. Finance is just doing their job. And they come in, and they say, oh, what's the business case? Oh, now that's, that's a great, clever question. Never heard that one before. But they go, oh, what's the business case? And the, the team working on innovation usually said, oh, well, you know, maybe it's a, you know, maybe it's a five or a 10 million J business in three years. If you're a really, really big company, a five or ten million JV business in a couple years isn't interesting. Or if you're a billion dollar year company and somebody says this is going to be fifty million dollars, not interesting. So finance, the classic finance types that are just doing their job, they was the business case, because that's my job to ask the question. They're, they're like taking ideas and they're strangling them around the corner killing them before they have a chance to get life, before they have a chance really to, to breathe and to grow. If you go back in history and you look at the, go look at the, the, pre, the IPO dates of, of all the biggest disruptors. Go look at the IPO dates of, of Facebook and Google and, and Twitter, and then do an advanced search in Google, and look at the, look at the news, look at the press, six months before their IPO. It's flooded with all kinds of, like, Facebook doesn't know how to make money. They haven't monetized global yet. How does Google make money? It's free, right? All of these comments. But these disruptors, they figure it out. And they don't let finance get too close to killing the idea before it has a chance to figure stuff out. So, I picked on finance. I'll try to pick on some other disciplines uh, here shortly. Um, anybody know what Dunbar number is? Dunbar number? Dunbar number 157. As, as, as large organizations grow, we, we have built companies over the last two or three hundred years in the same way. The pyramids. The pyramids, right? And we have lots and lots of people at the bottom. We have one person at the top, and you get on the corporate ladder, and they 
can tell you if you stay for 25 years, you get a clock. Wow, you get a clock. Thank you very much. I wish that cost 20 bucks. Thank you. Uh, but you stay for 25 years or however long they promise you that clock. And organizations, as we've been building them as pyramids, contribute to the problem of, of agility. They contribute because information has to flow up and down and the assumption is the, the top management has all of the thinking power, the top management has all the ideas. Everything at the bottom has to flow all the way to the top, all the way to the bottom, all the way to the top. And it obviously creates a very slow uh, decision making. And Dunbar's number says that the maximum effective team size is 157. It's about 150. And once you have any type of organizational unit above 150, it breaks. Stuff breaks the count. Because Dunbar's number is based on this idea that 100, we can have about 100, 150 people in this room, give or take. Then, then that's about the maximum size where I can know everyone by name. I won't know all your names in the next half an hour. But we can get to know each other, we can get to know what pieces or everyone's working on, we can coordinate that well. But we can't do that in a pyramid where things get really, 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 really big. And so these companies, they form autonomous units to go work on stuff, very, very loose coordination. But this principle they adhere to time and time again. It's a, it's a very advanced way of thinking about organizational units. Yeah, Google and Facebook and Twitter, they still have some shape of a pyramid, but I would, I would describe the organization as much more fluid, how people move around, and, and they're not just climbing career ladders. And information doesn't flow up and down uh, in those companies. It's much more diffused and flat than, than the organizations of the, the traditional organizations. There's a big difference too, it's related to the last one, and it's what I'll call a, 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 a scribe versus a chief status. A chief status says, oh, there's, a, there's a pyramid. In, in our pyramids, they're largely, largely age-based. They're age-based pyramids. They, they, when you get to the top, you're in charge. When you get to the top, you make all the decisions. What I'm seeing the disruptors do is the opposite. The those at the top are, are managing in a very different way. They're, they're more like um, they're more like traffic policemen. They're more like traffic control navigators. They're they're helping move things around, but they're they're both evolving decision making lower in the ranks, and they're allowing people without as much higher above them to go do great work. They're not micromanaging. They're not micromanaging natural leaders. What, what, what's known in the research is as a scribe status then comes to the top. And this is a very this is a very challenging notion for large companies to begin to move towards. I'm just saying the disruptors of the world are practicing this uh, I see these companies getting world class at customer experience, design thinking, human factors design. You've heard all the jargon, I just brought us one big thin diagram. But, but they start, they, they truly start with the customer and work backwards. And they truly start with the core problem they're solving. The, uh, I forgot what it was, the marketing professor Popper, I think, said it, but he, he once said that you, you don't go to the, the hardware store to buy a 12 millimeter drill, you're going to the hardware store to buy a 12 millimeter hole, and the, the, the drill is the way to do it. But you're actually, the problem you're solving is you actually have a hole. 
way to do it is a drill, but, but that's the problem you're solving as a whole. And, 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 and these companies have really got good at the core problem they're solving, and they're using all of these techniques to get to the problem they're trying to solve the customer and work back from that. And, and in the broad category, you can know, you call customer experience, you can call design thinking, maybe you have a few people that have gathered in it, but is it a core competence of your company? Because I'm seeing the disruptors, this is an absolute core competence of their, of their companies. This is why people love Apple products. It's, yeah, it's industrial design, but the software, that's customer experience. The, the, the way that product works has made people sleep in line like they're getting Rolling Stones tickets or something just to get the next product, right? If you know Aaron Levy in the box, his, his office is about 300 meters from mine, and he needs to tell his people not to talk at the, at the restaurant after we chain our offices, because you learn an awful lot when they go to lunch and they have their badges on and they're talking about stuff that's going on. But Aaron has this great quote about innovation, and Aaron says, Innovation is so hard because working on something that doesn't matter versus working on something that the customer doesn't know they need yet looks the same at the beginning. So all these all these startups, even big companies, they they, they, they get all excited telling me they're, they're working on something and then I check in six months later or a year later and it's not going so well. Because they haven't figured out the last problem, they haven't figured out the working something with somebody that a customer cares about. Right? They just think it's a great idea. They, they hadn't heard about it before. Oh, nobody's heard about it. Gee, the four of us in the room agree. It must be a good idea. That's what we'll do. And I see so many companies, so many companies that are building things that the market doesn't want. The, the market isn't raising their hand and jumping off the table saying, I have to have that. And I'm prepared to pay for that. And they, get, they, they think they're innovating, but think about this quote. Not this one. I've got kind of screwed up. Uh, I think they, the millennial values, the, in the last session, one of the, one of the CEOs on the panel was talking about his nine year old son and how different his nine year old son was. And, this new world, we're, we're, we're seeing a groundswell. My, uh, my father's 77, my youngest child is one. They have the same birthday and the same name. My father grew up in a world where he didn't have electricity on his farm until he was about 12 or 13. And my son, and, well, not my son, but the siblings near him are playing an iPad. We live in this extraordinary world right now, extraordinary change the last 20 years from no internet to a few billion devices and that's going to 30 billion IoT devices if you believe Cisco's numbers. But, but it's, it's fundamentally shifting behaviors globally that traditional businesses probably aren't ready to experience. And, and I'm going to touch on this a little bit more, but remember this slide when I talked about one of the other key ingredients which is, is around age. Um, what we're finding is, when you start talking about talent, getting talent to the large organizations, it used to be, what do I get paid? What are my chances of getting promoted? What function do I work in? And is it kind of in my career field? And that's all changed. All the research now is saying, what is the company's purpose and mission? And do I believe in that mission? And, and these new types of criteria now are coming to the top. And these millennials have very, very different expectations. And, and, and so they're running around making choices on which companies to work for, not based on salary, not based on, on career advancement, but do I believe in the values of the company? Do I believe in their mission and what they're working on? There's a huge, huge shift uh, than what we've seen prior. Who believes believes this slide? Who believes that if your employees are happy, then they're going to be motivated? Just raise your hand really high if you believe this. Wow. Wow. 
here's the secret. When I, when I have that much blank screen on the bottom, and ask a question like that, I'm probably going to say the answer is something else. <laughs> the answer is something else. It's, we do engagement surveys in big companies. And the engagement surveys, we try to measure happiness. Why are people happy? And the assumption is if they're happy, then they're going to be productive. And in Silicon Valley, because of the, 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 the idea of fast failure, the idea of experimentation, I think Silicon Valley figured out, by trial and error, they figured out what, what we'll call motivation theory. And motivation theory, it's been around about 50 years, I think I quoted somewhere. It's called core job theory. There's about 50 years of academic research, it's been proven around the world in different cultures. There's five things, five simple things, that make us motivated at work. And if we build those five things into our jobs, we're going to be motivated. True. Daniel Pink wrote a book, and he had two of the five variables right, because we're guessing. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book, he got three of the five variables right, also kind of by guessing. So, we watch these companies, we watch these disruptors, and we think they've nailed it. And here they are. Five, skill variety, task identity, task significance, autonomy, and feedback. Oh, that was a mouthful, what do you mean? Skill variety means I get to do lots of things. I have variety in the job. I'm not stuck with one tiny, narrow job, but I get to do several different things. That's more rewarding. I mean, think of assembly line work. All you're doing is you're moving a box from here to here. You get to that eight hours a day. It's not very rewarding, is it? That's why people on assembly lines drink a lot, do drugs. That's all they gotta do all day. Even if you said, okay, do that, and then you get to paint that one. That's more rewarding, because I've added the skill. That's skill variety. Task identity says, do I understand my job in relation to the other things around it? Do I understand the context, the, 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 the identity? Task significance says, does my job tie to a big goal? Is my job tied to something important? Or is my job really, it, it doesn't, it's not important. It's not affecting the company. Who, who wants to work on a job, right? You see how this ties to motivation? Who wants to work on a job that it's meaningless inside the company? The fourth one is autonomy. When, when, when people are asked to do something, let them do it. Don't micromanage them. Stay away. Just let them, you know, be there to be there to, to, to guide them if they want it, give them advice when they seek it. But don't call them in every day and, 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 and micromanage them and pretend that you're smarter than them and you have the answers and, and you're going to tell them how to do it. It's the worst mistake you can make. And yet in March, pyramid-based organization, we still need to manage this way. And the fifth one is feedback. People need feedback how they're, how they're doing. The problem is, as managers, we, we don't give good feedback. All the research says we, we, we don't want to tell people they're poor performers. We tend, right, it's not comfortable socially, you know. So we, we tend to not deal with that. Uh, but, but people need good and bad. But more important than feedback as a, as a manager, the more powerful feedback is from the product and service itself. Can you imagine? Can you imagine working at Apple? And you get on an airplane, and you're walking down the aisle, and you go, oh, three, three or four products there, three or four products there, three iPads, three iPhones, three MacBooks. I mean, you get on a plane, everyone's, you know, in the US, maybe it's Android here, it's not a Samsung. But you, that's feedback. Or you work at Facebook, 1.3 billion users, all your friends' moms are on it. That's feedback. You know that your product is, is accepted in the market. Billions of tweets a day in Twitter. That's feedback. So these people are getting enormous amounts of feedback, but they're doing a good job. And those five so-called core job dimensions, 
this is John Carroll, who's up there, of course, was poor job, very happy development. You can look, look at the research. It's been around since the late 60s. It creates this environment which creates these algorithms. Now, here's the shock as related to innovation. Here's the big shock. Gala is the number one company in the world that does employee engagement surveys. And they have something called the Q12 survey. And last November, one year ago, they put out a press release. And here's what they said. They said there's three kinds of people in every organization. The top performers that are engaged, the middle performers that are kind of indifferent, and the bottom, which are just checked out. They're just collecting their paycheck. They're careless about you your company. They fake it. They pretend. But they put people in three bands. And their top band, the people that are actively engaged, is 13%. Think about this. Think about this in the context of innovation. This is Gallup's own number, not my number. If, if you work in a big company, then the average is 13% of people that are turning up engaged. You don't have much of a chance to innovate. So you've got to design those criteria for the jobs. But of course, this room, you're all engaged right now. It's late, the sun's gone down, they're still here, so this group's very engaged. The old school is qualitative. We were, we were very qualitative in, in how we made decisions. And the new school is, is quantitative. And the way businesses are working today, it's extraordinarily data-driven. These disruptors, and the Googles, the Facebooks, and the Apples of the world, they're extraordinary at, at data and data science. And math is also, math is becoming a differentiator. I'll give you a little analogy. The analogy is uh, a spreadsheet. We all work with spreadsheets. And I go to a big company and I say, are you working on big data? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a big data project. Lots of them. Oh, okay. Can I meet? Can I meet the team? So what do you need the team? I said, I want to meet the team of data scientists. Data scientists. I mean, I want to meet the PhDs in, in math, and chaos theory, and operations research, and physics. I want to meet all the PhDs working on it. And they're like, we don't have any of this. They start giving me all the jargon, you know, the Duke and Hyde and R. They're trying to trick me because they think I understand technology or something. And, and, and the point is, like, like the spreadsheet. When large companies talking about big data, they're defining it, to use the spreadsheet analogy, they're defining it as, as rows. And they hear the word big, so they think volume, they hear the word data, so they think, you know, uh, technical. And it's almost like the traditional software industry, it's almost like the IBMs and the HPs and the Oracles of the world are selling that BI again. They're defining big data as a, as a volume and rows problem. What I see the disruptors doing is defining it as a columns problem, not a rows problem, a columns problem. And a columns problem says there's lots and lots of variables, and I've got to figure out which variables, which signals I can extract value from to build a business that nobody else can build. So when you go to a Google search, there's 12,000 variables that Google looks at before it gives you those search results in, in a microsecond. The top 10 results you get is at 12,000 things in the so-called algorithm. 200 of those are primary, and about 11,800 are secondary. But they're looking at everything from where you are right now, to your past history, to what device you're using, to you know what language you're using. I'm using all kinds of variables. So big data is a columns problem, which requires data scientists, not a rows problem, which is business intelligence from 15 years ago. And in big companies, I still haven't really met a, 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 data, a data scientist team that I find inside of a, you know, a Google. Because that, that's their competitive advantage. That becomes a competitive advantage in every industry is being digitized, every industry. So-called OTG threat that operators have felt, it's being felt by financial
financial services, is being fought by retail. Google delivers groceries now. And they deliver groceries now, Google Shopping Express. They deliver groceries because it's all a big math problem to them. It's all, all algorithms and logistics. Strangest clicker. So, this is the follow up of the slide. Data science in our, in our mind are, are these, these different skill sets. And I'm running a little over, so I'm going to put to these last few and ask some questions. These companies have become very, very good at talent mapping. They're, they are they're scanning the world for talent. We used to have this jargon, you know, the war on talent. We, we really have to, you know, hire good people. But I think that has also become a catch phrase. And I think large organizations particularly, they get lazy and they have job openings. They have 100 people they need to hire at Vina or, or in, in Europe. So they just build jobs. And they're not as selective as they ought to be. I'm seeing these companies say, we know over the next three or five years we're going to need these types of jobs. The, the people aren't the people are working. The people already have jobs somewhere else. Our job is to extract them. We're not waiting for resumes to come to us. If resumes come to us, it's a marketplace. The market's spoken. They're, they're probably not that good. They're, they're in high demand. They're already working. And, and I think incumbents, as we move into a, a world where every industry is being digitized and math becomes a competitive advantage, business becomes much more quantitative and not qualitative that multinational have to be very good at pulling these people out of, uh, of existing jobs and have to be very good at, at talent mapping globally. Or regionally, even, even regionally, even, even countrywide. Start talent mapping, start figuring out the data scientists and Royal Canadian Airlines you've got to pull out. Find out who's doing this the best, you know, in either in Jordan or, or in, in the direct region. So we know this story. Oops. We know this story that Jobs and Gates and Zuckerberg and Dell, Michael Dell, they all were 19. They all quit college and they all created some pretty interesting companies. Ages, I'm going to say it. But now, wait a minute. Stop for a moment and forget about tech. But think about world history. That, 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 Charles Darwin was 28 when he came up with the theory of natural selection. And Albert Einstein was 26 when he came up with, uh, sorry, Darwin with uh, the theory of natural selection. Einstein was 26 when he came up with the theory of relativity. And Leonardo da Vinci was 23 when he came up with the first self-propelled machine, basically a bicycle. And Westinghouse was 18 when he did a lot of his early uh, inventions in the mechanical era. Louis Graham, Louis Graham. Came up with the, the real system. Well, why? Why is it that, that in, in Silicon Valley, in tech, generally these under 35s are getting the money? Why is Sandra Road betting on these under 35s? You open TechCrunch or Mashable or Pando, and you're saying, this kid is 23. He just gave him $20 million. He just got out of college during quick college. It makes no sense. No experience. And then you read later and it's $53 million. And he just sold his company for two or $300 million when he was building it, right? And I think there's something going on here that's more important than experience. The big companies, the age-based pyramids, say, well, when you're 40, you get some responsibility to be a general manager. But, but yeah, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Twitters of the world were all started by these people in their twenties. And I can't even remember all the ten criteria, but I'll try to rattle off some. I think it's on the next slide. These under or is it the next slide? Yeah. These under 35s have a bunch of criteria that are very important. They're on the right here. They have they don't know what they don't know. They have they have something to prove. I don't have anything to prove in my life anymore. They have, they have nothing to lose. They don't know what they don't know. They've been more recently skilled and educated, right? You ask me a program that's going to be in COBOL. Seriously. They, they tend to, they're, they're by definition closer to the future. 
every year setting a higher bar and arguing that's the way you're going to get great performance as a, as a company. I would, see, I would much rather have, be it a startup or be it a big company, I would much rather have a great team with an average idea than an average team with a great idea. The great team with an average idea will win every time. Every time. And startups generally are pretty good at, generally pretty good at, at finding better talent. Almost done. These companies are good at focus, but focus doesn't have to be small. Focus can be broad, which sounds like a paradox. Google generally is focused. Generally, for, for the last 10 years, certainly, it had this idea of, quote, organizing the world's information. It was focused, actually. Um, it's now kind of scattered around and doing things in different industries, right? It's doing certain financial services, and retail, and launching media, and automotive, and, and a project that extends human life called, called uh, Calico. We're going to have a project to make us live longer. Um, but it all gets back to data, so, so I'd argue that they have some focus, although it doesn't look like it. And I'll end on this idea of, of culture and hiring for weirdos, misfits, pirates, outliers, and renegades, they call them. And you, you think about it, big companies, they do their best to not hire these people. They try really, really hard not to hire them. And, you know, they come in for a first interview, and, you know, you run Myers Briggs on them, or, or whatever your other first screen tests are, and you keep the weirdos out of one performance. All the research says we hire people like ourselves. And we often make it remind in the first five or ten minutes of an interview. If you come into the interview, you have a good connection, you're the candidate. The other people I meet, you know, I, I cross out the list, but what worse is I don't even get to see them do their job. But it's, you know, I only use the interview process. But you remember the, you remember the, the, the Steve Jobs book? This is exactly what he was saying. In large companies, we would hire those people. But when I look at the disruptors, they're full of weirdos and misfits and, and, and crazy ones. They really are. And those, there, there's, you know, there's a long list of, there's quite a bit of research that, that, that points to creativity and people that are, that, 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 that have some, you know, higher, high functioning uh, people that are on some type of uh, so-called spectrum. <laughs> huge, huge, if you learn these companies, huge concentration of, People with Asperger's, people with ADHD, uh, people with uh, uh, autism, the autism spectrum disorder. Last year, SAP announced, I didn't see if it was even legal, they announced that they were hiring people with autism. Look it up, look it up. I, I, I didn't even know it was legal to say they were doing that. But these people with autism, they actually look at problems differently. And they're really, really good at complex problem solving where you look for patterns. Wow. And yet, in big companies, we screen these people out. So, so there was the, should be a bit worse. There was the first 10. And there was the second 10. And I know we're running out of time. A few questions?
this comment about you don't have to be first, but copy others. Uh, that, that's, that's, that's interesting. How would, how, would I, how would I square this two up? Um, it's a great question. How would I, how would I square this two up? You stumped me. I haven't had the question before. You might win the, you might win the prize. Um, I don't like here. They didn't say anything very long. I still have the right question. I might have to come it offline. I, I had stumped on the podium for a couple of years. Uh, boy, you got me on that one. I can't, I can't explain it. I can't explain it to you. I can't. Maybe, maybe the, 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 the cognitive power of over 31 is catching up with me late in the day. So, well, sorry, I can't think of a good answer, but I'll get back to you. Any other, any other questions? One year, then back over here. Good evening, my name is Carol. I want to ask you, what do you think from the 20 points you were mentioning that it's the most challenging one in the IT section in Jordan and the MENA region? I think, uh, wow, finance, I, I think the, the motivation number 15 here is to or number 13 might be a very, very hard one to do. Um, and I think the hierarchy one is also, I, I think a lot of meta, I've been to pretty much every meta country, uh, they're very traditional cultures and hierarchy and somebody's in charge and they manage down. They're, they're, they're pretty traditional in that regard. And, and yeah, I've never talked to the culture as well. I, I think a lot of these can be challenging. Yeah, I might have put 20 on the list, I put 13 on the list. There's, there's just still early in some of our research. Sam, with a question. Uh, where does the education system come, come into place in this? Because we know that central to the culture of Silicon Valley are the likes of uh, Stanford and Berkeley, as you mentioned. So how do things tie in? Stanford and Berkeley have have a part to play, but they can't provide all the talent that's feeding Silicon Valley, right? The talent valley idea that Google and Facebook are, are going to put all countries, they're looking at the top 30 graduate schools around the world, pulling talent from. Hundreds of people from all of these programs are, they're either being pulled into Silicon Valley, they're putting in regional offices. So it's not just Stanford, we're defeating it. But let me dig a little deeper on this because I think uh, I think a lesson for Jordan might be a little closer to home. We actually worked on a project uh, with Turkcell in the last year called Digital Academy. Turkey has 85 million uh, people, and it has uh, Turkcell has 35 million sub subscribers. And the CEO of the company, uh, Survey Asinov. He wanted to raise, uh, ultimately he wanted to raise uh, education in, in Turkey. It's a young population, English isn't so good, and he says we have to create a, a, an online learning platform, a so-called MOOC, for the country. And we can do it in such a way that, that, that our, our young kids are really keeping up in this digital economy. And I applaud him, he's not doing it to make money, he's not doing it to drive our way. I think he's being a wonderful corporate citizen to bring these to bring these very young people up. So I think that I think the education question is a good one, but I wouldn't think at the university level. I'll tell you one other related story. And I would start very, very young. I would start as young as you can go uh, in, in new skills. I, I, I spoke in June in uh, Beirut, and, and I was asked a similar question. One year ago, I, it was one year ago, it was November of last year, my daughter was at the time five, kindergarten. And she goes to a public school in, in Silicon Valley, a normal, normal school, it's a good school, but it's a, it's a public school, not a private education. And I happened to be home, I wasn't traveling that day. She came home, and I said to her, I said, what did you do today, what did you do at school? She's five. And she said to me, we learned internet coding. Oh, wow, what? And I, you know, I was, I was rattled, I was shaking, I was like, what you? I said, 
My follow-up question was, what is that? What, yes, what, what is it? What, do you, what is it? You know, tell me. And she says, it's where you teach the computer what to do. Five years old, that was her definition. And here's my point. My point is that, that it would be amazing for Jordan to adopt this program. This program is called Code.org. Code.org. And they're starting to roll out. It's already been internationalized. But if, if you as a country did that in, in, in 20 years, you would have remarkable to accelerate that, accelerate that type of understanding. And so the, when I mentioned Beirut in June, the punchline, when I got to answer that question, when I, when I, I had a minister in the room uh, from the government, and he was asking about how, you know, how to do this, and I said, teach coding. At the youngest age, I gave this exact example. And, and replace it with the French. I mean, I respect the, I respect the teaching of French in Lebanon. I understand the heritage. But, but those coding skills, for five and for a girl, two for a girl, and four of my six are daughters. But to have that type of understanding at an early age, and Jordan would be amazing if they were to take the look out work and bring it into the country and make it mandatory across the schools. It would have phenomenal, phenomenal impact in, in a decade's time. So I hope so. I hope somebody grabs that initiative and owns it. I think it's a nonprofit. I think the content is free. You have the mic. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrea. What I want to ask actually is what do you think for a small startup is more important? Like to focus on whatever you're good at or like to do or experience a lot of things like you think. What is more important for like, a small yeah, startup? Yeah, for a small startup. Yeah, for some. Is, is it like to focus on whatever you're good at or like try to uh, experiment with stuff? Well, I wouldn't necessarily focus on what you're good at, but in fact, the point I was making about, you know, what the market wants. So, I, I mean, yes, you have to so called play in your strengths, but, the, but the, the very, very first thing you do at, in the startup is to find a problem. And, and, and meet that need, find the problem and fill it. So it's not necessarily, well, what am I good at? Maybe I should go to start up. I'm turning around and saying, where is it that I need in the market that's really interesting? And then therefore, let's go find the, the talent to deliver it versus what I'm good at, let's go find something to make. But I would turn it around and say, find the, find the customer problem first and then find the team that's delivering versus what I'm good at. Makes sense. Two more questions, I know we're uh, out of time. Anything else? Yeah, who is the mic? Sandy or who is it now? Pass it thanks. Hi, Mark. Uh, I just want to uh, uh, understand your idea. Uh, regarding my friend's question, he, he said that when the market is digging, I have to sign. But when you pushed over to the next step, he said, how about we follow rather than lead? Now, if I understood you correctly, what you were trying to say here that if I'm not very good at to get new ideas, I'm not that good at uh, innovation, how about I follow other ideas and follow their mistakes to, to get something from it? Was that correct or wrong? Well, I, I, yeah, it, it actually let me answer the question now. On, on the latter point around you don't have to come up with the new ideas, the point I was making there is it's these combination of ideas combination of a bunch of old ideas with some business model innovation is, is actually probably a more efficient way of finding some, some great new growth. That, that was the point around these combinations of ideas, which is different than don't follow where everyone else is going. So that was the, I didn't, I didn't think, as I explained it that way, there was a conflict between the two. That's that, 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 that's what I was trying to say earlier. Okay. Wow, great group, still here at the end of the day. I, uh, I, I want to thank uh, Omnia for, uh, for asking me to come over. I, the, the ICT forum was fantastic as well. Like, really, the, the buzz, the, the stuff I saw on social media the last week just coming, it just really made me excited to, to be here. And I thank you all for your.
your, uh, your patient 